1927 Yanks, 114 wins, including a World Series sweep, six Hall of Famers, team batting over 300, lead the majors in runs, triples, and homers. Four players with over 100 RBI, four pitches with 18 or more wins, and the league MVP. Yep. Only one word to describe him. Underrated. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. I figured this week I'd give you Yankee fans, and of course you know I am not a Yankee fan. And you could say that I did a tribute to the Yankees a couple of weeks back with the uh, revisit of that great game between the Yankees and the Red Sox. But I, I was thinking today about a show. And I love going back into baseball history. And some people will say you're an expert. I am certainly. Let me put this right there out in front of everybody. <laughs> and my brothers will attest when we're playing Immaculate Grid on baseball reference. I am no baseball expert whatsoever. I do have maybe a little bit no more knowledge about certain years, maybe certain teams, certain events than others. But I am no baseball expert. However, what I do love about this show, and of course, a special shout out to the producer, Howard Fredericks, is that it has allowed me to really venture deeper into baseball history, uh, football history, and other, uh, other realms of the great games that Americans participate in. I figured I wanted to do something about the 1927 Yankees. I don't know why it just came out on a lark. Uh, but I had done a show about Ruth and Gehrig. Who hit the most home runs? Was it Ruth and Gehrig? Was it Aaron and Matthews, McCovey and Mays? And I think I had one other guy or, or a group, one other in there. And now, of course, that that escapes me right now. But And it, I did determine, I think, that Ruth and Gehrig, over their career together, had like 69 games where they hit home runs together. And Mays and McCovey were about the same. And I think Aaron and Matthews were real close, but it was just amazing. So one thing led to another. And of course, I did that show a couple of years ago. And of, uh, of course, my memory is fading on me. And I wish I re had all of the notes uh, on that just to be a little bit more accurate. But believe me, it wasn't 100 games, but it certainly wasn't only 25. That being stated, I figured... Let me investigate these 27 Yankees a little bit more because I think through baseball history, it's probably acknowledged that if they aren't the greatest team of all time, they are one of the best. And I actually think they are the best. And the reason being, they won, okay, the exception of the Seattle Mariners and, of course, the Cleveland Indians. They won more games during the season. And, of course, the great Yankee run in the late 90s won more games. But... Uh, there's an asterisk to two of those teams, the Mariners and, of course, the Yankees, and that was the fact that uh, eight extra games allowed them to win X amount more or had more opportunities to beat the Yankees. The other thing, too, is that this Yankee team swept through the World Series. So in, in point of fact, they probably finished, and I, I didn't, now that I, I think about those other teams, I didn't do the winning percentages of the Cleveland Indians, I know it was higher than the Yankees. Uh, the 54 Indians were higher than the 27 Yankees. I get that. And more than likely, I believe it was 116 wins for the uh, Mariners. Probably higher. Well, it might not have been higher. Might have been close to what the Yankees are. But I didn't figure that out. But just give me a little bit of license here. And let's just say that the Yankees of 27 are probably the epitome or... or what you think of when you want to load a team and just go out and just flat out just destroy everybody. So I was looking not just at Ruth and Gehrig, and I do have a little special segment on Ruth and Gehrig, but I was looking at the pitching set because lo and behold, I don't think the Yankees, they've had really some good, uh, how do I say this, clutch pitch. I'll tell you how I, I got onto this. 
I was watching Yankee Digest or whatever, Yankee History. Mantle said something the other day about how the Yankees would acquire aging veterans like a Johnny Sane, and they weren't having any success with their previous team. The Yankees would acquire them. And of course, the winning ways of the Yankees, all of a sudden it would revitalize their career and they're winning big games for the Yankees. So that kind of led me into this. And I was looking at the Yankee pitching staff of 1927. Didn't even realize this. But first of all, let me just say this. They do have six Hall of Fame players on that team. I have my little notes ready for this. Let me just read my bullets on the Yankees from that year. Obviously, they are 110, 44, and 1. Everyone thinks that it was the house that Ruth built, but the Yankees were only a few games better at home. They were 57 and 19 in Yankee Stadium, as, uh, but 53 and 25 on the road. Here's the big deal with them. Yeah, they were 68 and 20 against teams under 500. But there are only three other teams, I believe, that were over 500 that year uh, in, in the American League, including, and there were five teams under, let me just, let me just, I, I just want to get this right. In that year, Yankees were, had a 714 winning percentage. The Philadelphia A's, which would battle them, and remember, they would win pennants in 1929, 30, and 31. They actually won 91 games. And how many times do you see a team win 91 games? Not just not win the division, but finish 19 games out of first place and playing 591 baseball. Yeah, there have been teams that have won 90 or 91 games, like I said, but they would be off the pace by, let's say, two or three games, probably being eliminated in the last weekend of the year. Here are the A's, and it wasn't even this close. It really wasn't because the Yankees actually got better as the year progressed. It wasn't like they had some sort of a slump. But there were 19 ahead of the Philadelphia A's and the Washington Nationals in one of their few good seasons played 552 baseball and won 85 games. And then the Tigers won 82. The rest of the league, of course, was under 500 with the Red Sox finishing in last place, 51 and 103. And I just want to tell you, they finished 59 games behind the Yankees. Meaning, think about it. Let's just say there were 60 games in the season. <laughs> they would have to win the, all 60 games, and the Yankees lose all 60 to win the division. That's how bad it was. That's basically playing two months of perfect baseball. And uh, lo and behold, it didn't happen, of course. But the Yankees actually were 42 and 24 against the five uh, teams over 500. I'm just trying to do a quick, that's 21 and 12. Divide that, that's seven and four. So you're talking about a 680 winning percentage against those teams. They had Lou Gehrig, who is the MVP. They had. Um, Four players with 100 and more RBIs. They were, of course, Gehrig, who led the league with 170. Imagine 173 RBIs uh, in 155 games because he is credited with a tie that they played. Nevertheless, 154-game schedule, 173 RBIs. And then here's Ruth. How many times has this happened? Not only do you uh, finish second, with 165 RBIs, but you, you finish eight behind the leader. And then you had Bob Musial, who had 103, and Tony uh, Lazari had 102 RBIs. Now, Lazari was a pretty good player. I know this. My brother uh, had informed me why. Lazari, I think, belted in over 200 RBIs when he was playing in the Pacific Coast League. But my brother, I, I was just amazed at that. Still unbelievable. But they had played like 200 games in the season. Still a remarkable record. But you can, I, I mean, that's a testament to Lazari being a clutch player, a very good player, uh, MV, uh, not, not just a very good player, but a Hall of Famer, one of those uh, key players in the Yankee dynasty. And of course, Bob Musial. Uh, very good outfielder, uh, good hitter, and he is uh, not a Hall of Famer, interestingly enough. He's not a Hall of Famer, but he's got stats that are probably good enough. And that particular year, I'm just looking. Earl Coombs 
is the uh, Hall of Fame. No, I'm so, yeah, he's the Hall of Fame outfielder uh, with the Yankees during that time. Coombs was a, a really good player, but he didn't have a particularly quote unquote great year that year. He only hit 299. His lifetime batting average is 325. And in 1927, he does do one thing. He leads the league in triple with 23, and he had 36 doubles, only 64 RBIs, scored 137 runs. Now, he he was the guy who usually hit in front of Ruth and obviously got on base Ruth or Gehrig would hit him home. But for this, ready for this, one of the reasons that Earl Coombs is a Hall of Famer. From 1925 to 1932, not only did he score over 100 runs a year, his lowest uh, production was 113 in 1926. 1927 probably does have his greatest year ever. 36 doubles, 23 home runs, 6 homers, 64 RBIs. He hit 356. So he's a good uh, 30 points over his lifetime batting average. I, I, I mean, you talk about just things just coming uh, together all at once. It had to be that 1927 uh, Yankee ball club. The other thing I wanted to talk about was this, and I got to get this all out before I talk about Ruth and all the rest of it. The Yankees had four really interesting pitchers. They had on the club, ready for this, I just want to go back. Well, I'm going to talk to you about this. How weird is this? Um, the great Yankee teams, probably the four managers that we think about with the Yankees in their uh, in their history. Joe McCarthy, who had been a successful manager elsewhere. Joe Torrey, Miller Huggins, and of course the great Casey Stengel. What's interesting to note is that Huggins was a failure or an under 500 manager in his other uh, managerial places. In fact, Huggins comes to the Yankees, ready for this, from the St. Louis Cardinals. And the best record he ever had was uh, the year that he, uh, the year before he goes to the Yankees. He finishes with the Cardinals at 82 and 70, 539 winning percentage. But he also lost 99 games. He also lost 81 games. And he lost 93 in 1916. That being said, he had a 455 winning percentage before he comes to the Yankees. And with the Yankees, he wins over a thousand games, has a 597 winning percentage. Joe Tor Joe Torrey, ready for this? Actually, I can't believe how many years he managed. Started with the Mets as a player manager in 1977. Uh, went to the Braves. Of course, remember, he has that one run with the Braves where they win their first 13 games and hang on. They only win 75. They actually go 75 and 74 the rest of the year and win the division. That was 1982 and then get trounced by the Cardinals. Although I will put a little asterisk there because I believe either in the first or second game, Phil Negro had a lead and the game was canceled because of rain and the Braves were up. And, of course, they lost Negro couldn't come back the next night, even with throwing a knuckleball. And the Cardinals kind of regrouped and swept the Braves. Then he goes to the Cardinals. And for a franchise very similar to the Yankees, never really, and a guy who played for the for the Cardinals, never really does anything of, of great, has a high of 87 wins in 1993 after posting uh, 84, 83, and 84 wins, respectively. Uh, but uh, in 1995, he's finally let go, uh, going 20 and 27. The Yankees, and I will be one of those guys that I was I was baffled when George Steinbrenner hired him. I didn't know what the Yankees were thinking. Well, guess what? The Yankees knew more than, quote, unquote, an expert. Uh, they Joe just had great. What is it? Maybe it was just, you know, you always rooted for Joe Torre as a player. You always felt bad because he just missed playing on the great Braves teams of the late fifties. Then he played for the Braves, made a few all-star teams, was never seen as a great defensive catcher, but he could hit. And then the Cardinals had just finished their great run in the sixties, trade for him. And they don't get anywhere with Tory, 
And uh, they trade him, of course, to the Mets, bring back Brooklyn Joe to the Mets. And, of course, he was – they trade Seaver on him. Uh, he was in the middle of, let's say, the Mets' rebuilding process where the only guy they had, when you think about it, they got rid of Matlack, and as I've said often enough, they got rid of Matlack and Kuzman as well. It was just a bad time for the Mets in the late 70s and early 80s, and he had to be the manager there. Uh, then he goes, of course – uh, to the Atlanta Braves, wins there, has the one division, nothing, goes to the Cardinals, nothing, then goes to the Yankees. And in 1998, probably the highlight for them, it's one of four years where Joe Torre guides the Yankees to 100 wins. He was 114 and 48 that year with the Yankees, 704 winning percentage. Now, the Yankees of 1927 have a 714 winning percentage with those 110 wins and, uh, and, uh, and 44 losses. That being said, yeah, the Yankees actually won 125 games that year with only 50 losses. So they probably finish, and I'm not going to do the math now, I can almost guarantee that they probably finish with a higher winning percentage than the uh, Yankees of 27. But, of course, it's expanded. They just drilled everybody that year. There's just no stopping them. But then he goes to the Dodgers without – he does win 95 games in 2009, but never was able to generate the same thing. That, what I'm trying to say is, here are the Yankees of 27, the Yankees of the late 19, uh, 21st, uh, 20th century, and then the Yankees in the midst of their great, what we, we can say, uh, dynasty, all with managers, because here's Casey Stengel, all doing it with managers who weren't successful in their previous stops. Ready for this? And I remember reading the article, uh, a book on Casey Stengel. He's he's a pretty funny guy. And uh, I think many of the things he did were obviously deliberate. Other things, I think it was just his character and personality. Uh, he was just a, a funny guy. And he's another guy that I would have treated like Joe Torrey. He was never successful with the Boston Bees who become the Boston Braves, wasn't successful with the Boston Dodgers, who are one time the Boston Robins. So he got pecked and he got stung by those two teams starting with the B. Now he comes to the Yankees after winning only 47 games and 107 tries with the Braves and, and the Braves get rid of him. And he wins 97, 98, 98, 95, 99, 103, 96, 97, 98, 92. This is all during a 154-game schedule. I mean, you talk about a guy who is just woo, pulverized the uh, pulverized the opposition. Here is Miller Huggins, who, like I said, lost 90 games twice in his five-month stay. And it's interesting that Torrey and Huggins both were with the Cardinals, and that Torrey and Casey were both with the Dodger franchise. Interesting. Just one of those things. But his first year, he goes 60 and 63 with the Yankees. All right. After he's hired. Then he goes 80 and 59. Then he starts his run. 95 and 59. 98 and 55. 94 and 60. 98 and 54. Has a bad year. 89 and 63 in 1924. Has a worse year. Remember, Ruth got the bellyache in 1925, and they go 69 and 85. Then revs up the engines again, 91 and 63, 110 and 44. And in 1928, goes 101 and 53. Yes, 110 and 44 is a higher winning percentage, 714. But in his five years with the Cardinals, only a 455 winning percentage. With the Yankees, 597. Now, so you bring this guy in, and again, if I was probably watching baseball way back in the 20s, I would have said, man, the Yankees don't know what they're doing. And here he produces how many World Series championships, how many pennants, and of course, he gets to manage uh, potentially six Hall of Famers on his team. Torrey had four, at least, right, with Jeter, uh, with Jeter. Well, I can't really say that because there might be some others that, oh, well, Jeter and Mariano, at least two. Uh, you could say there's a couple other guys. Time will uh, time will either get them in or uh, things might change with Clemens, Andy Pettit, and uh, 
you know, that he had other players that he brought in who were, let's say, on the edges of their uh, careers that produced for Joe and the – I actually think Bernie Williams should be in. But that's another story because I want to stay with the – and I think Posada should be in too. So there would actually be like your six guys. Uh, but that's just me. Now, on this Yankee staff, and this is where I want to go with this, that Yankee staff, and I, I was looking at the team, and I'm saying, well, first of all, let me just do this. Here's the war. Babe Ruth had a 12.6 war. He had 60 home runs that year. Wait until you see this. Gehrig had an 11.8 war. And obviously, those two guys, I can kind of understand their wars. Then you have, let me just get pictures of these guys. I do have them this week. My son was able to fix it for me. Here is Larrap and Lou right here. And, of course, the great Bambino, Babe Ruth, with Miller Huggins right next to him. And here's push him up, Tony Lazari down here, who I do believe had a very tragic ending to his life. I think he fell down a flight of stairs in his home and broke his neck. And um, I'm pretty sure it was Lazari. But anyway, he was a great player, uh, good, I, defensively good, uh, clutch hitter. Lazari coming from the Pacific Coast League along with people like Joe DiMaggio and his DiMaggio brothers. And then there is this. You have Wade Hoyt, all right, who is a Hall of Famer. Wade Hoyt had a 6-1 ERA that year. Wade Hoyt has a 52.5 war. He was 237 and 182 lifetime. Now, just a pedestrian ERA of 3.59. But to be fair to him, he was pitching during the great offense of the late of the 1930s. In fact, he pitched from 1931 all the way to 1938. Uh, actually, in 1933, with Pittsburgh in 12 games or with a five and seven record, he actually had a 2.92 ERA and followed that by winning 15 with the Pittsburgh Pirates in, in uh, 1934 at the age of 34 with a 2.93 ERA, 15 and six. How interesting is this? 7.14 winning percentage. But for the Yankees, 1920, he comes aboard with the Yankees after being with the Boston Red Sox. With the Yankees, wins 1919. 17, 18, has a down year in 1925. I guess all the Yankees really did suffer with the Ruth and his bellyache. He goes 11 and 14. Then he goes 16 and 12 in 1926 rallies. He has a 385 ERA. And then in 1927, his greatest season, well, I would consider it his greatest season, even though he had a higher winning percentage and one more win in 1928. But consider this, in 1927 and 28, he actually wins 45 games, 14 losses. That's it. His winning percentage leads the league in 1927, the 759 winning percentage. His ERA, though, is 2.63. Now, the league ERA was over four, I do believe. So that's weight Hoyt. And he would go on to pitch uh, number uh, 21 years in the majors, 10 years with the Yankees, followed by f five years with Pittsburgh, three with Brooklyn. The Giants pitched two years. Boston, he pitched two. Detroit and Philly, two and one, respectively. But uh, had a really good career with the Yankees, 616 winning percentage. Now, look, winning does help your record. I'm not saying that. But there are other players – that have gone to the Yankees that simply couldn't get it done as well. Now, there is one guy that I got to bring up here. And these are the other uh, four pitchers for the Yankees. We'll see more I want to get back to. Urban Shocker, I am amazed at this because I am starting to think that there are certain guys that are just overlooked. And Urban Shocker pitched for the Reds. He pitched in the 1919 World Series. He has a higher war. Then Wade Hoyt, he won 187 games against 117 setbacks. He's 70 games over 500 with a 3.17 ERA. And ready for this, uh, with the St. Louis Browns, 
and they were subpar with the exception of one year that he was with them. He goes six and five, 13 and 11, wins 20 games with the 1920 Browns, wins 27 to lead the American League in wins in 1921. In fact, he was 27 and 12 with a 355 ERA for the St. Louis Browns. And I think this might have been the best record he played uh, on the team with. But that Brown team went 81 and 73. And he went 27 and 12. The following year, this is what I mean. He was 24 and 17, 297 ERA, and the team won 20, 93 games. Okay. So he excelled when they had their best records. But then he wins 20 games with the St. Louis Browns at the age of 32 when they finished under 500, 74 and 78. When he goes to the Yankees, he finally gets redemption a little bit for his career. He wins 19 games in 1926, and then he wins 18 games against six setbacks with the Yankees in 27 with a 2.84 ERA. So in two years, he wins 37 and 17. He goes 37 and 17. Just amazing. And you're starting to think, man, maybe we should start looking at some of these older players, Urban Shocker and all the rest of it. The other guy is Dutch Brother. I think I pronounced that right. And Herb Pennock. Now, Pennock is a Hall of Fame pitcher for the Yankees. Uh, he was certainly a, uh, I would say, even though he had, he had a, uh, he won 241 games, 162 losses, 3-6 ERA, 45 war. He loses one year because he was in the military service in 1918. But ready for this? He pitched, started out with the Philadelphia A's. They trade him to the Red Sox. And then with the Red Sox from 1919 to 1922, he actually won 55 games and lost 52. But most of those losses came in 1922. He finished 10 and 17. The Yankees get him rescue him, and in 23, he leads the league in winning percentage, going 19-6 and six with a 760 winning percentage and a 313 ERA at the age of 29. To make this fast, over 1926 and 27, Pennock, uh, or Pennock wins 42 games against 19 setbacks. In 1927, he goes 19-8, and eight, 704 winning percentage with a even three ERA. And during that time with the Yankees, he pitched 238 innings, 286, 277, 266. And in 1927, the Yankees kind of spelled him a little bit, and I'll tell you why. He threw for 209 innings. He pitched over 200 innings, 200 and actually 25 innings, four straight years, and over 200 innings in seven years with the Yankees. Now, the other guy... Down here is Dutch Ruthner, or Ruthner. And uh, interesting, he does pitch with the Cincinnati Reds of 1919, uh, the team that was, unfortunately, they do beat the White Sox in five of eight World Series games. But unfortunately, that game, that World Series title, even for the Reds, they won it. Uh, it's always been kind of tainted. He actually had a 29 war. But ready for this? He's 42 games over 500 for his career. Again, a 3-5 ERA. Not bad. All right? 137 wins. But with the winning World Series champion Cincinnati Reds, he, like uh, the other Yankee pitchers, goes 19-6 and six with a 760 winning percentage, 182 ERA, leads the league in that respect. And then he is, in his last two years, he finally is rescued from the Washington Senators, although he did pitch for the Washington Senators in 1925. Ready for this? Uh, the only time they ever won a World Series. And, uh, no, I'm sorry, they lost the World Series to the Pirates, four games to three. That was the game uh, Walter Johnson lost game seven, uh, I, I believe, of that in extra innings. Let me just check that, see where I'm taking this. This is just incredible. Yeah, Johnson lost that game 9-7. He was just like hanging on a thread. No, it didn't go extra innings, but I know he surrendered uh, a couple of runs late after pitching just beautifully, winning two games in the series, 4 nothing, 
and 4-1, but kind of ran out of gas. But Ruthner was on that team, so he, he pitched there. I will tell you this. In his postseason, in 1927 for the Yankees, he goes 13-6 and six in the regular season, 338 ERA. He has a 684 winning percentage. Now, many of you say, well, you know, everyone did so well because it was with the Yankees. But here's the deal. He had a 2.95 ERA in his uh, his appearances in the World Series. Actually started three games, was one and one. He did not pitch in the World Series for the Yankees in 1925, nor did he pitch for the Washington Nationals uh, in the 1925 series. Um, but he does win two championships and loses. Actually, pitched in four world. Uh, actually, was part of four pennant winners and four World Series teams. Pretty good. And now the last guy of this pitching, kind of interesting, and his name is Wilsey, not Wiley. Wilsey Moore. Now, his greatest season in the majors was the year he's with the Yankees in 1927. He actually won 19 games, but most of those games he pitched were coming out of the pen. He is a spot starter, and he kind of starts slow. He's rescued from the Sally, or he was pitching in the Sally League, had won 30 games down there. And, of course, the Yankees spot him. They send down the scout. The scout wasn't too happy. He said, I don't think we should sign him. But I know that <laughs> he lost out in that argument because the Yankee general manager just signed him because he said, hey, he still won 30 games. We got, let's just give him a shot. Well, he paid dividends for the Yankees because uh, he won 19 games, saved 13 through 213 innings, and had a 2.28 ERA. We'll see more. He was from, he was actually a cotton farmer from Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, he had, but after that year, he had another year with the Yankees or another two years with the Yankees and total, he goes 10 and eight with 418 and 413 ERA, even though uh, he leads the majors or the American league with nine saves in 1929. In 1930, I was reading about him with Sabre. Here's what happened. He hurt his arm, doesn't tell the Yankees, and he comes down basically what, what they claim was a sore arm. What he never told the Yankees was that he actually fell off his roof and I think onto his shoulder and uh, hurt it. And uh, it did bother him. And, of course, uh, his performance on the mound with New York and Boston were, uh, well, with the Yankees, showed that, there was some injury there. Takes the year off, comes back. Boston actually signed him. He actually goes 11 and 13, leads the league in saves, had a 388 ERA. So it does come down. And that Boston team in 1931, 62 and 90. So he was far and above uh, a, a successful pitcher for that team. The Yankees reclaim him a couple of years later, but he only goes seven and six. But at least he does pitch for the 32. Yankees and their World Series. Now, the last thing, I kind of went off on a tangent here, but I do have the Ruth and Gehrig, and I just want to run this down. Now, yes, they had other Hall of Famers on the team. I, I, I listed them already. There were Earl Coombs. I, I did a little bit on, on him. Tony Lazari, Wade Hoyt, and Herb Pennock, uh, two pitchers, Hall of Famers. You can see why. They were gutty, gritty pitchers. Yeah, maybe. On other teams, you can claim they were 500, come to the Yankees, and wow, it's like the Magic Kingdom. Yeah, but you start to wonder, is it because you're playing with good players, or do they instill confidence with you, or does the pitching coach say to you, hey, you know what, these guys will do everything for you. They'll, they'll get you five runs. Don't worry about being picky, you know, picking at the plate or, or pitching to perfection. Just throw the ball. We'll field it, and we'll win. So you don't know what I, I would love to have been there when the pitching coaches first meet these guys and say, listen, we got a great team. Just throw the ball, let them hit it. We'll be fine. And that takes a lot of stress off you. Let's face it, right? But they had Lazari, Gurrig, and Ruth, Earl Coombs. There's your four offensive players, two of them outfielders, Herb Pennock and Wade Hoyt. But now that I get to the Yankees, ready for this, here's what I was looking at with the – by the way – 
That Yankee team, I did do this. They only drew, well, I guess only drew, they were number one in the American League. They drew 1.1 million. They averaged 15,000 fans. Their highs were 72,641 at a July 4th doubleheader, which interestingly enough, the Yankees in the combined sweep scored 33 runs. And here's an interesting thing. I was even, I have to get this in as well. The Yankees actually scored more runs on the road than at home by a good two dozen. Interesting, right? The house that Ruth built and the Yankees were actually a more potent offense on the road than they were at home. Here's the other thing, though. And, of course, this probably has to do with the times. Most of the games were played during the day and all the rest of it and, you know, transportation, all the rest of it. The Yankees, even though they averaged 15,000, they did play before crowds of 50,000 or more only five times. Three of them, uh, two of them were for double headers. 40 times the Yankees at home, almost <clears throat> over half the time, they played in front of fewer than 10,000 fans. And I'm getting all this from the Baseball Reference website. And they had six times that year where they played in front of only 3,500 or fewer fans at Yankee Stadium. And in fact, the low was 1,500 against the St. Louis Browns in May of that year. Interesting. I, I just find all that interesting, okay? Then I was looking at this. <laughs> now, the Yankees, which are largely defined by Ruth and Gehrig, and this is why. Ruth and Gehrig. Ruth hit 60 homers. Gehrig hit 47. Gehrig had 175 RBIs, hit 373 to capture the MVP. Ruth didn't get a single vote. And when I was baffled by this. I do remember my brothers telling me that at one point, like it was like this, uh, if you had won the MVP, you had to almost like kind of sit out kind of like what the big 10 used to do with the Rose Bowl. Like if you won it the previous year, you couldn't, you couldn't have consecutive appearances in Pasadena. Well, it seems to be the same way that they did the MVP because even though Gurry had a beast year, he was still like one full point under Ruth in his war, because Ruth led the entire league in in war with over twelve, like a twelve point eight that year. Now, I went through all one hundred and fifty five games because remember there was a tie early in April, and I discovered this. I just wanted to see what Ruth and Gehrig did together. Well, as I said, Ruth and Gehrig, Ruth homered forty one times by himself solo. Gehrig 30 times. And together, they hit home runs in 10 games in which the Yankees were, were 10 and 2. The Yankees, ready for this? Oh, man. This is unbelievable. When the Yankees, when Ruth and Gehrig hit, hit home runs in the same game, were 8 and 2. When, Ru when Gehrig homered by himself, they were 24 and 6. <laughs> 800 baseball. But when Ruth homered in a game, they were 35 and 6. Take the totals together. They homered in 81 games with um and they had a 67 and 14 record in those games for an 827 winning percentage. Not only that, but I'm telling you right now, there had to be a a definitely there was a rivalry between the two because what I started to notice and it didn't always happen, but I think as the season really heated up and, you know, the weather got war warmer and all the rest. And, of course, I don't have this written down. But ready for this, there were instances where it went, Gehrig hit a home run, then Ruth, Gehrig, then Ruth. Two days later, Ruth. Two days later, Ruth. Three days later, Gehrig. And there was a succession. I, I'm just looking for it. Ruth went on a, a tear. Oh, and by the way, they batted three and four in all games, in every one of the games. Now, the only reason I said it is because I did look up, let's say, Lou Gehrig, and he was, when he first came up until Miller Huggins finally settled on 3-4 in the order, 
Gehrig was used, just like Henry Aaron was, in different spots in the batting order. Sometimes he, he actually let off. Sometimes he hit second. Sometimes, on occasion, he hit in front of Ruth. Sometimes Miller put him fifth in the order, etc. But for this entire season, Ruth hit third. Gehrig hit fourth. The Yankees won 110 games and a four-game sweep in the World Series uh, because of that. Uh, and... The last thing I want to say, ready for this, from game 123 all the way to 134. The Yankees only got shut out once, and that was by Lefty Grove, by the way. Uh, ready for this, game 123, Ruth hit a home run. Ruth hit a home run, number 42. Gehrig then followed with a home run uh, in game 125, 41. Then Ruth counters with number 43. Then Ruth and Gehrig both hit home runs. Ruth is 44th. And Gary hits two bombs in a uh, 42 and number 43 in game 127, all off a guy named Rube Wahlberg. Together, they went five of eight in that game. Then they lost one nothing to Lefty Grove. Ruth actually had two hits in that game. Then in, 19, in game 129, Gary hits his 44th. Together, they go um, five for 13 with Gary going four for six. Then in the only time, I think there's only two instances all year where I see Ruth and Gehrig both go hitless. They go 0 for 6 in game 130, and they win the game. Then, <laughs> ready? Ruth hits two bombs the next day, and Gehrig follows with one. So Ruth hit his 45th and 46th. Gehrig his 45th in a win, number game 131. Then 132, Ruth hits his 47th. Ah, but Gehrig hits a triple, his 16th of the year. That was one of two games that they lose in this whole stretch. Then Ruth hits his 48th and 49th. Goes six, uh, together they go six for 10 in game 133 with a win. They score five times and drive in seven. Then they wait a couple of days. Then ready for this, it goes Ruth, Ruth, Ruth. He waits two more, Ruth. So from game 137 and 142, Ruth hit 50, 51, 52, and 53. Rests three more games. Uh, no home runs, rather. He played every game. Then Ruth hits 54, 55, and 56 in, in successive games. Waits two days. Gurry comes back, hits his 46th. Ruth counters in game 152 and 153 with three bombs. His 58th and 59th. And number 60 off Tom Zachary, who had been a victim of his Early in the year, a couple of times prior to this, and Gurig also victimized him. And then in game 154, their 110th win, Gurig ends his season with his 47th bomb. Over that time, you can see that these guys went back and forth, back and forth, a testament to their great competitiveness, but also a testament to great Yankee teammates. And this was a celebration, a salute, and a praise of a team that really is many times overlooked as the greatest baseball team, having the greatest season of all time, the 1927 New York Yankees. This is Will O'Toole. Thank you for joining us. Special shout out to Howard. I'll see you next week with another edition. Bye now.